Thank you for joining us. Tonight is the second lecture in our summer lecture series at the College of Architecture and Design at Lawrence Technological University. My name is Carl Dobman, and I'm the Dean of the College. The summer lecture series is part of our critical practice design studio in the Masters of Architecture degree. The critical practice studio, like its name implies, attempts to look at practice of architecture critically through the way we work, the way we organize ourselves, and the way we carry out projects. The summer studio culminates with the construction of a, of a pavilion during a one-week on-site intensive. This year, we brought in three architects for the lecture series. All three are engaged in defining the design and construction process through their practices. Tonight's lecture is with Brian Ringley, and he is at what I would say between the three lectures, he's at the technological edge of what's happening in the construction industry. Brian Ringley is the construction technology manager at Boston Dynamics, and he supports AEC customer applications for the SPOT platform. He promotes the development of new autonomous behavior that adds value to construction project delivery. Brian holds a Master of Architecture degree from the University of Cincinnati. And this is where I first met him when I was teaching a visiting master's studio there on digital design and fabrication. Since that time, I watched Brian's career. Uh, I've been amazed where he's ended up in different firms and the positions uh, where he's been able to advance this type of knowledge in these areas. Brian teaches computational fabrication and industrial robotics as a visiting assistant professor at, Pratt's, at Pratt Institute's Graduate Architecture and Urban Design program. Prior to Boston Dynamics, he was a senior construction automation researcher at WeWork, where he managed the construction robotics research program and contributed to the development of facilities, products, and industrial automation processes for modular prefabrication as part of WeWork's offsite construction strategy. I was able to reconnect with Brian last year when he was in town in Detroit at a robotic training session. He wasn't able to share anything that he was working on at WeWork because it's part of the research. But I was so excited when we reconnected uh, with the thought of this lecture series and found out that he could actually publicly share some of what he was working on with Boston Dynamics. So I'm excited to be able to have this lecture to be able to host this lecture with Brian. The title for his lecture is Automating Construction Site Data Collection with Spot. Um, and unfortunately, I forgot to press record. So Brian's first two slides and commentary was omitted. But here is the recorded lecture starting with slide three. So I hope you enjoy. Thanks for joining. Logistics space as well as PIC, which is vision software um, for recognizing it basically uses some deep learning models to recognize boxes and then to be able to grip them appropriately and move them around and then handle is kind of like a an industrial arm on wheels that's able to pick those things up and move them around the factory floor um, and more recently interact with other types of warehouse robots like amrs i'll touch on that again later um, on the right we have atlas atlas is the r d robot that's you know not for sale it's just it's purely about uh pushing the bleeding edge of dynamics in robotics and you know every week the progress it makes is insane um and uh this is the robot that does backflips and parkour um and pushes the limits and the lessons learned in that effort you know trickle down to the commercially available robots and then we have our kind of all-purpose leg mobility platform which is spot so um boston dynamics had a kind of poc phase that i participated in at wework where we were testing in, in 2018 along with some japanese construction companies and then through um 2019 and into 2020 i've done an early adopter program for general contractors and builders and people in the aac space generally um that is continuing now but as of Last week, we announced the direct sale of Spot. So now any kind of enter, uh, enterprise level or industrial uh, customer, you can't buy them for your house yet. They're not really suitable for your house. They're not really 
they're not really for that. Um, but any, any company can now just go onto our web store and buy a spot with a credit card. So I think that's pretty crazy that there's e-commerce now for quadruped robots. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen our uh, YouTube videos, which are very popular, here is, this is the latest one that's been posted of Atlas. Um, so this is a kind of autonomous routine of Atlas jumping and doing some obstacle avoidance. And, you know, not only is this biped robot able to walk and jump and maintain its balance, but it can actually do a backflip, um, which is super cool. Um, and it's a mix of kind of pre-programmed, hard-coded behavior and dynamics, and more and more is just getting into perception, the ability to kind of sense the space and then react accordingly. Um, so with SPOT, it's really about this history of legged robotics. Um, and if you study the history of robotics, uh, the 80s were a fascinating time because the precursor to Boston Dynamics was actually something called the Leg Lab that was founded by our now chairman, Mark Rabert. It was first at Carnegie Mellon in the early 80s and then moved over to MIT before it actually spun off or spun out of MIT and became Boston Dynamics. This was also the same time that um, the Japanese construction market was aggressively looking into robotics, but they were mostly focused on wheeled paradigms of motion um, and attaching arms to bases, things that are actually still not fully solved and under active development. Um, but on the side of the leg robots, there, it was very clear. I mean, they kind of had this statement, which is just like uh, only about half of the Earth's land mass is accessible by wheeled robots. So from the get-go, the idea of legged robots was to be able to get automation anywhere in the world. So for me, I focus on bringing robots into a human-purposed environment like a construction site. But, you know, more broadly, it's the idea that robots should be able to go anywhere and into any environment. And... The way to do that is to follow the cues of natural evolution and legs and then um, and then explore that through robotic balance and mobility. So Boston Dynamics um, has been a company for about 30 years now. Um, and it started kind of with simulation software and some of the work early work at MIT and then um, by the early 2000s was getting a lot of its funding from DARPA to look at mobility in, um, in kind of rugged and harsh terrain. So from left to right, you have the big dog robot, which was actually the first leg robot to leave the laboratory environment and go out in the real world. And that's really like the goal of Boston Dynamics is like, how do we actually deploy robots into the world and have them not just be a research project? Um, and then the development of Wildcat in 2013, which was all about speed. So it was able to move at 32 kilometers per hour while maintaining its balance. And then the LS3, which is just like this crazy, like diesel powered, like steel beast. Um, that's really just about being able to carry a ton of weight, a ton of packs for, for troops in these environments um, while maintaining its balance. So here's a video of that, of course. I'm not sure how well the videos will stream, so I didn't include like a ton of them. Um, but, you know, so this is, yeah, this is the early 2000s, uh, and there's the famous kicking of the robots, uh, just to demonstrate that they can maintain their balance. There's the, this is actually the Boston Dynamics parking lot in Waltham, Massachusetts, where they do a lot of robot testing. So here it's going uphill and in the snow. Um, we actually don't kick the robots anymore um, just because we like to be nice to them and also because people come up to the robots at conferences and like drop kick them and it's not safe. Um, when Boston Dynamics moved over to Google, um, there was this idea about trying to bring this leg mobility kind of into more domestic or human purposed environments. So it was really all about scaling it down. So you had classic spot and spot mini, these kind of precursors to the current spot product and they were able to navigate a domestic environment, go up and down stairs. So that's where the initial stair behavior was developed. Um, you can see a very early prototype of the arm here um, being used to load the dishwasher. This is not the primary use case that we push, but you know, there it is. Uh, this arm, actually the now commercialized version of this arm will be available later this year. So that's super exciting. Um, and then you can see its ability to kind of slip and regain its balance fairly elegantly, which
which is really important in industrial um, environments. And then here's the product or the spot platform as we know it today, uh, which is created for mass manufacturing and has the safety yellow for industrial and construction environments. Um, so kind of in review, you've got Spot Classic. This is fairly quick development over the years to Spot Mini, um, the miniaturized version and the first version that included the arm for the manipulation capabilities, and now onto Spot as we know it today, starting in, in 2017, first with the alphas and then the betas, and now we have what we call the gamma, which is the commercially available product. Um, so we ask a lot of questions when we think about bringing automation into these environments. I mean, this is, this is not a new concept. This has always been a challenge. Um, you know, construction is, is often kind of singled out as not being able to increase productivity, not being as digitized as other trades and industries and kind of lagging behind. And the thing I repeatedly emphasize is that it's not for lack of trying and it's not for lack of intelligence and expertise. It's not that the construction industry needs Silicon Valley to fix this problem. It's just because it's a really hard problem. Not only is it an environment that is, um, that is purposed for, for humans and not for automation, but it's, it's changing every day. Um, and that's, that's a really difficult robotics problem, especially when you talk about full autonomy. So we consider all of the classic automation issues here. How do I reduce the three Ds? What's dull, dirty, and dangerous? Can I, take a, can I take a worker out of a hazardous environment? How do I increase value by maybe doing a kind of lower value task that frees up human labor for higher value tasks? Um, how can humans and robots work together to achieve greater value? And ultimately, once you actually do socialize and deploy robots onto the construction site, how does it change the very nature of how we work? So this is in 2018. Um, this is one of the very, or no, this is the very first construction site um, that Spot went on. Um, I also love that this was on Takanaka's construction site because they actually pioneered the use of robotics and construction starting in around 1985. It's a fascinating history with them and, and a number of other Japanese GCs were very active in this area. So here's Buchita as well. So these companies are continuing that tradition uh, by being the very first companies to see the value of Spot and to bring the alpha units on their site. Um, so here's Spot's equipped with a 360 camera. Um, in this shot, it's actually going through a tunnel. Um, and when you think about these environments, you know, how do you actually operate spot in these environments as well? So there are a number of other considerations here too, which is are our construction sites connected enough? You know, do we have job site Wi-Fi? Do we have job site LTE? If I'm in a tunnel, what's the comms network can I use? Can I use mesh radio? Can I use high powered radio? So there are a lot of other adjacent technologies that have had to develop alongside robotic mobility. Um, to really make this uh, a valuable proposition. I'll touch on that more. Um, the question we ask now with the release of the spot platform. So the spot platform says, here's a robot, here's a base mobility solution, but now we have a number of payloads, so extra hardware devices you can put on the back of spot that are useful, like cameras, like scanners, like LiDAR, computers, um, and an SDK. So how can we start to work with developers to create an ecosystem of useful tools that interact with Spot and extend that value stream? And the question I like to ask customers, because initially the conversations about direct ROI or return on investment for deploying robotics and construction is, it's about automation. It's about the reduction of labor hours on a job site to save money. And I think that's, valuable but a bit short-sighted. I really like to consider the kind of longer term indirect ROI implications, which is if you can collect a hundred times more site data, you know, what can you do with that to add value to a job site? Um, so I talked about some adjacent technologies that have had to develop in tandem with um, robotics and robotic mobility. So you've got powerful AI and ML in the cloud, You've got you know, 5G someday, right, um, that's coming online, but as well as you know, cellular stuff and LTE that exists. Um, edge compute capabilities and portable sensors kind of at the ready that can be attached to the robot. 
Um, so, you know, one of the things we point out is what you're missing is you're missing a capable mobility platform. So if you're just interested in deploying static sensors in a site, you, you have to anticipate where those sensors will be that valuable. You have to purchase lots of those sensors. You have to put them in fixed positions that will be difficult or expensive to change. So what we're proposing is, well, you know, what if you could get a sensor? What if you get your favorite sensor anywhere on site you need to get it to capture valuable data? I mean, that's really the, pro the value proposition of a mobile robot. And hey, by the way, the only one that can get anywhere on a construction site um, is a spot, is a legged robot. Um, so, you know, we always say it can go wherever people can. It can't climb ladders yet. That's something that, you know, there are still a few things that Spot can't do, but it's, it's fully capable of doing stairs in autonomous mode. When the arm comes out later this year, there will be some pre-canned autonomous behavior for opening doors. Um, along with this basic stair capability, it can also do open risers and graded stairs and platforms, which is really important for a lot of industrial environments and actually is is really difficult to do with robotic vision. It's like, if you look at what Spot sees, it's like it's on an acid trip, but that's working now. Um, so it's got an approximately eight to nine kilometer range on a 90 minute battery with self-charging solution coming in, you know, maybe the end of this year, or early next year. We've been testing it in-house and it works. We just want to get it right. Um, easy to use autonomy. There's basically like, if you know how to use a video game, or you know how to play a video game, you'll know how to control a spot in a matter of you know, 15 minutes. It's super easy to use. Um, and it can carry up to 30 pounds of sensors, cameras, thermal imaging, uh, laser scanners that collect point clouds. Um, and it has a flexible SDK, so you can develop it to do whatever you need it to do. Um, and as I mentioned before, there are these obstacles to getting enough data in, in job sites. You don't want to send people around to collect it because that's a really low value task to use human labor for. Fixed sensors have the limitations I already went over, and drones and AGVs or autonomous ground vehicles, um, they just can't navigate. You know, drones can navigate the space but have really low battery lives, and when they fall, they drop out of the air, and they also can't really carry much. Um, and you can't use the really large ones that can't carry a lot for indoor applications. And AGVs with wheels or treads will just inevitably get stuck or confused in a construction site. Um, so these are the payloads I mentioned uh, in terms of the things that Boston Dynamics offers out of the box. Just to, you basically, one is we wanted to make a few things that just gave some value on top of the robot that would be available to get customers started. And two is we wanted to develop them in a way that you could like throw them off the side of a building or throw them down the stairs over and over again and they want to break. So everything we sell is extremely ruggedized, uh, just like the robot, which has, I believe, an IP54 rating, which means light rain is okay, but don't go swimming. Um, so the spot cam collects 360 photos, but it's also really good for teleoperation or remote operation. If I'm, you know, I'm in my apartment in Brooklyn, but I want to operate a robot at our headquarters in Boston, um, I can grab a tablet and I can connect to that robot, and then I can see through either the robot's body cameras or through the 360 camera as I navigate that environment remotely. The Spot Core is an onboard computer and that just allows you to develop additional applications and software on top of the base Spot. All the computers inside Spot are for robotic mobility and you don't touch those. Um, so the external computers for development work. The arm is for manipulation, either autonomously or telemanipulation. Um, and then the GXP is basically just a customer power port that just makes it easier to interface with power and data. The SDK, um, for those of you who maybe aren't developers, is basically, it stands for a software development kit. Um, you know, part of that is online documentation. You know, how do I get started? And part of that is an actual code repo. So you have APIs, um, which are commands that are available through Spot. Um, and then you have a lot of code samples. Um, this is all done in Python. The idea was that you do not have to be a roboticist to be able to build useful applications on top of Spot. We went with the most user-friendly programming uh, code there is. I mean, you know, architects use Python to write apps in, you know, Revit or in Grasshopper. So we figured that would be the most accessible code language. Um, and it also allows you to connect other devices. So, you know, it's, 
it's easy enough to just 3D print a mount and attach a camera or a laser scanner on top of SPA, but what you actually want is you want to be able to control when those scans are triggered at predefined locations or waypoints so that when SPOT is roaming around in the environment autonomous, autonomously and it gets to a particular location that you want to scan once a week, it knows to do that. It stops, it triggers the scan, it waits for that data collection to complete, and then it proceeds with the rest of the mission. Um, so we've had a few initial integrations. Um, one of them is Hollow Builder Spotwalks. There are all of these applications on the market right now that help you take data such as 360 photographs and then contextualize it relative to your environment. The most basic way that this works is you take a photo with a 360 camera and then you pin it to a particular location in a floor plan. And then you do that night after night after night so that you can start to get a four dimensional timeline view of how your site is changing over time. A lot of these applications are also developing advanced modules that leverage things like machine learning. Um, to train on very large sets of customer construction site images and to be able to recognize things such as what percentage of drywall sheathing is up over studs, which gives you then a work in place report. Um, you know, and that's, that's what you want, right? It's, it's not enough to just have the robots cool, the data collection is cool, but so what? You have to be able to use that data to automate other downstream processes and demonstrate insights. If you can get automatic work in place reporting, that then leads to other ways of cost savings. Now all of a sudden you can automate payments to subcontractors, which um, currently is just like, you just kind of look around the site and you kind of guess what's been done, or a subcontractor calls you and yells at you until you pay them. And it's a huge waste of everyone's time. Um, so there's some really uh, large value opportunities um, if you really take the long view about what having ac this much access to, uh, to well-structured data means for your business. Um, so here's a video of Hensel Phelps at the San Francisco airport construction site. So they're one of our customers. They were actually the first customer to use the Hollow Builder Spotwalk app. And it just works off your phone. You... Uh, it, we actually changed, they changed nothing about how the app works. It just works with the robot instead of with the human walking around with the camera. So this worker is trailing spot, maintaining a line of sight Wi-Fi connection between their phone and the robot. There's actually a holder on there and, and there's like a countdown in the app. So you can also just put your phone um, or hopefully your company's phone, not your own phone, um, onto the robot and then the robot can go um, largely unsupervised from that point on. So here's some images, some 360 images. I love, you always see the robot in the bottom of the 360 image, um, which is okay. You don't really need to see the floor. It's really about this, the rest of the 360 sphere. Um, so we're, we're still testing this. Um, and it's also worth describing how the autonomous behavior works. Um, the way it works is that you pilot spot manually with a joystick controller. You record a predetermined path, all the locations you want Spot to go. You record any actions, if you want Spot to take photos or perform laser scans or do a little dance, you know, whatever needs to happen. Um, and then Spot will repeat that exact same path over and over again, night after night, as your site changes while still avoiding basic obstacle detection. So if a person gets in the way or there's a toolbox or a lift where there wasn't the day before, Spot will just maneuver around that obstacle and continue on its mission. So in addition to the continuous site monitoring and 360 image collection, we've also been really excited about autonomous laser scanning. If any of you have ever been on a reality capture crew, you know that basically you go out, you set up a bunch of tripods, and then you set these like really long scans, and then you like hide behind something so you don't get captured in the scan, and you like play a game on your phone until the scan is done. It's not really a good use of a skilled workers time. So um, everyone's super interested in this particular application. Basically, they think of Spot as a walking tripod, and that's essentially how it works. You have a scanner on top of Spot. You have a set of predefined waypoints along its autonomous mission route where it knows to pause and take those scans. And the cool thing about this is Spot basically acts as a very sophisticated um, IMU. Um, the same way your phone has an IMU device in it, so it knows when you're tilting it or moving your phone around to help with navigation, you know, Spot has all of those sensors as well. 
So you can actually use that data to also automate the point cloud registration process. So the way that laser scanning works is that you collect a lot of different point clouds of your environment, but then there's some overlap and you register them all into one single point cloud. That also takes a lot of time. So I think it's really cool that we're automating both the collection of the data and some of the registration and post-processing of that. Um, we have another integration with uh, Trimble uh, with their X7. This scanner is pretty cool. It's a little bit more lightweight. Uh, it, it color matches spot, which is, is nice. Um, it's also got self-balancing. Uh, we're looking at some robotic behaviors about just how, you know, flat spot needs to keep its back when it scans. I mean, by and large, as long as you have the position orientation data, that shouldn't matter. Nevertheless, um, the kind of self-calibration, registration, and um, leveling of this device is pretty slick. And then in tandem with Spot's mobility is, uh, is something I'm super excited about. That's, it's a pretty cool combination of tech. Um, Trimble is an interesting company, too, because you know on one hand, they have their hands on a lot of BIM stuff, which means that they can think about um, both upstream and downstream software connections. Um, you know, how do, we, how do we direct Spot's path using building information, but also how do we take the data and then augment the building information after we get that for, for better as-built conditions and four-dimensional models? But they also have all of this. I mean, they're experts in geospatial work and, and precision surveying and layout. So they've also integrated a GNSS device, um, a smart antenna device, uh, which allows for GPS navigation of Spot, which is really nice for outdoor applications. Um, and then what you're seeing here is actually an RPT or rapid positioning tool, which is kind of a more user-friendly version of a robotic total station. Um, so then through a basic like Wi-Fi or radio connection, you can actually perform layout with Spot. So that's a laser pointer on the back of Spot. So the Spot can walk around and then use a laser to point where something needs to happen on site. And you could imagine that there are a lot of different paradigms of how that might work. You know, maybe there's a second spot that comes up and marks that point or, or does something based on where that point is. So I think that's a really exciting future trajectory. Um, so, you know, when, when COVID hit, um, the very first thing we did is we're all a bunch of like makers. We have like a really amazing fabrication facility and a lot of us, you know, have like sewing machines and, and other tools at home and are hobbyists and craftspeople. So we just started making like a crazy amount of masks. Um, but then we thought, you know, what else can we do as a robotics company? So we started working with Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston for um, what we call a telemedicine application. And essentially it's, it's just a telepresence robot. Um, but the idea is to be able to do patient intake remotely so that you're not exposing frontline healthcare workers to potentially infected patients. Um, we recognize that you probably don't need a legged robot for this. Um, so what we did was we open sourced all of the work. We have a repo uh, that we call the Dr. Spot like repo that we've shared. We've worked with non-legged mobile co robotics companies like um, ClearPath and Shark Robotics on this and, and shared information. Um, and the idea was, you know, just to spend some time contributing, but Ultimately, this, this was obviously useful because the return to construction sites requires things like social distancing. More people are working from home and need remote access to the site. And it's interesting because the very first release of Spot was all about teleoperation or remote operation and, and by extension, telepresence. Um, and then we kind of backed off of that to really focus on autonomy. We knew that construction customers in particular wanted uh, you know, a repeatable data collection path, and that really became the focus. And now we're kind of back where, okay, how do we have the autonomy and the teleoperation? And in fact, you can do both together. So like I can, I can connect to a robot in Boston and also record a mission and then execute an autonomous mission and supervise that remotely. And that's kind of, that's the ideal is that you would have a few VDC, BIM, or, you know, PMs, you know, whoever your specialists are, kind of at a centralized location, and they could remotely monitor, you know, a fleet of these robots on many different project sites around the world. Um, and that's really how you'd get the value out of that. So some other things looking forward, I mentioned uh, Spot Arm, you know, later this year, early 2021. Um, here are some pictures of 
I think almost the full commercial version that we'll be releasing. We're almost there. Um, and you know, this is, it's really, the arm is really interesting because it actually has a camera in the palm. So there are a couple distinctions here because, because <laughs> when I first learned about spot, I was like, why don't you just put like a universal robot arm on the back? That's like an arm. Everybody knows it already works. What's the big deal. But really like you have to, if you want an arm to work with a quadruped, you have to rethink the entire kinematic body. You've got joints everywhere. You've got the legs and the arm. They should really work together. And that's, that's a fundamentally different type of robot than just sticking an arm on top of a platform. Although in some cases that might be useful as well. Um, and again, this was initially developed because we said, well, you know, we want some way to manipulate. We don't want the robot to be so passive and always about data collection. We want some way to manipulate the environment around us. And the first thing was like, well, let's just be able to open doors because the idea is for Spot to get anywhere. Doors are the obvious limitation in most of these environments. You can still lock them, by the way. So Spot can't pick a lock yet. Um, but you know, for now, uh, it actually uses a camera, right? So this is not like a pre-programmed set of motions like you would do with an industrial robot that's doing a repeated set of actions. This arm needs to be able to come across a bunch of different types of doors. So here's Spot going through our headquarters and opening every single door in our headquarters. And the way it does that with, without us going crazy programming like the same thing over and over again um, is that it uses the camera and it uses machine learning um, to recognize the type of handle, to recognize whether it's a push or pull door, and then to grip that correctly and then exert the, the proper forces on it. And some of the best unreleased videos are of this thing freaking out um, and like flinging the arm and ripping the door open or the whole body turns sideways. Um, but it works pretty well now. Um, and there's still plenty of types of things that can't open, but, uh, and, and I think when we do go and release that arm, you know, we'll show a lot of other cool things we're working on with that. Um, but the door opening behavior will be one of those things that's available out of the box. Um, so Spot itself, like if you just look at the core robot, it does not have um, AI per se. It does not learn from its environments. Um, it's not running any kind of machine learning algorithms or storing the things that it sees. Spot is like just perceiving the environment and then following the mission plan um, relative to what it's perceiving. So in order, to, in order to add that extra level of intelligence on top of Spot, uh, we've partnered with some other companies. So Vinza is a company that develops these kind of out of the box machine learning modules, which are basically just modules that say, this module allows Spot to see a gauge in a photograph and or video stream and then to be able to read that analog gauge value. This is actually an interesting thing in a lot of industrial environments is it's insanely expensive to make every single gauge digital, which would be my first instinct, just digitize your environment. That's actually not feasible in a lot of these environments. What is a much greater value proposition is have a robot that's capable of reading these things. So, so that's an example of adding AI on top of Spot. This is another example of using that. SDK I previously mentioned. Other examples of this type of vision include being able to do safety detections to see if a construction worker is wearing their hard hat or their safety vest. Um, something really popular lately would be a, a model for recognizing social distancing. Are people maintaining the appropriate distance to not spread infection on site? Um, something I'm also interested in the future is, is fleet behavior. So I mentioned the idea of centralized control. So presumably the idea is that you could have multiple spots and multiple environments, but also multiple spots working together in a single environment. So, you know, the examples that we've shown in a few of our videos that I've pictured here is that one spot opens a door and other spots move through. Um, we also have some examples where a lot of spots move together to like haul a truck, for example. Um, we recently released a video that shows this, briefly shows this crazy vehicle we constructed where it's, it's a giant like hexapod robot spider where each leg is a spot. So that's four times six. It's a 24 legged spider that walks around. It's super crazy. But the idea is that 
you can have these robots achieve tasks together. And if they work together, um, they can achieve more complex tasks. But in order to do that, you need to have fleet management. Um, this is actually an image of another type of quadruped on the left and then an image of Spot on the right uh, in New Zealand um, pretending to shepherd or herd sheep. That's not really a good use of a robot in our opinion, but um, <laughs> that's just what they included in the video. But the idea is that this company, Rokos, is developing fleet management software. And it's not just for Spot. It's saying, you know, a, a lot of industrial customers are incorporating many different types of robots into their environment. So we call these heterogeneous uh, fleets or multi-species robotics. Um, and you want all of them to work together in kind of one centralized command and control system and to all be able to feed data into your centralized data systems in a coherent way as well. Um, we've actually done some work in this area, not with, not with Spot, but with Handle. Um, so this is Handle working with um, an AMR, which is an autonomous mobile robot. Um, and this robot is basically capable of going to shelves, picking boxes off of shelves in a warehouse, and then loading them onto an AMR robot, which then takes them you know, to a truck or to a person for checkout or whatever needs to happen. So the, this is a kind of proof of concept that you know, multiple robots can, in fact, work together to achieve you know, much greater value, hopefully value that's just greater than the sum of their parts operating separately. Um, and then as my, I think this is like my next to last slide here, um, I'm really interested in the arm for, for marking on site, you know, the robot is not is not a surveying tool. It's like with Trimble, there's an opportunity to perhaps do some some robotic layout. There's actually another company called Dusty Robotics. It's basically a printer on wheels. It's much much better uh, task specific robot for layout right now. I would definitely go with them and not us for this. But um, but I like this idea as you know, and this is just a simple like G code, you know, script running on top of the SDK. It's really nothing fancy. So I think there's a lot of a future opportunity. Um, with the ability to, to manipulate in addition to the ability to sense. Um, so thank you, that's it. That's crazy, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine, well, we'll see. I imagine some people are terrified. <laughs> there, yeah, I, we, we actually, yeah, I deal with that a lot. There's. It's funny, when you work with robots all the time, you also realize how committed they are. They are not going to take over the world anytime soon. But that said, it's, it's fascinating the things they can do and the way that they can add value to these day-to-day -day tasks. Well, and I, I think it's amazing, given the, the first lecture in our lecture series where we were talking about the kind of digitization of the construction site, right? And the way that probably as architects and designers, we've had this data for a long time and it's been how do we translate that um, i think rolando talked about some of those difficulties and i think what you're talking about as well is just like what even precedes the ability to do some of those things right to in order yeah. to to see the site or supervise the site or track the the 4d aspects of the site and and understand those things it's like you're kind of starting that right yeah, and it, you know, at WeWork, they had actually acquired an application called Field Lens, and there's like a long history of robotic data capture integration of that because it was immediately recognized that you can't actually leverage the power of like a data management software like that, or really any of these like amazing tools that are coming on, like SmartVid, right, which, which is able to process video streams and give you insight into job site safety. Like, it, it doesn't matter if you don't have the data in the first place. And if you look at the way that most construction companies are collecting it, it's, it's very haphazard. And, it, and it's simply not enough volume. So they, they need to collect more volume. It needs to be better structured. But they also want to spend less resources on it. So, you know, it seems that there needs to be some way to bring automation on site. And that automation has to be mobile to get those sensors where they need to go. Right, and the complexity of the job site in order to, to capture it too. 
Oh yeah. Like even the, even, I mean, the Japanese job sites are like immaculate, which is, so that was a good place to start. Um, but you know, <laughs> the, there's, there's so many things. It's like, there's, you know, somebody was like doing some like wet cut saw work and there's like a, a puddle of water, which is fine, but then spot steps into that and then hits the sawdust on the floor, which creates like a grime and it slips. And, and it's funny, we're pouring all this, effort into things like anti-slip behavior because we just know that that's an inevitability and it's, it's kind of just facing the challenge right it's like the the first of all the robot is always going to fall there's no world in which you navigate these environments and you don't fall down so what you do is you accommodate that you build self-rate behavior the robot can get back up in the context of autonomous mission um, and you just work against the falling problem with anti-slip behavior and better balance and more graceful falls too like you can actually say like it's going to fail but let's make it fail more gracefully so that whatever expensive laser scanner you put on the back of it doesn't get busted so sarah's got a question and i'll elevate her to panelist and as i do that maybe one one question i would ask too is that so we're we're teaching an architecture design studio this summer right or like what would what would your advice be to emerging architects at this point right because in some ways what you're talking about we they're on maybe a few construction sites like prototypical examples like pilot projects where we start to see it like how do you imagine it transforming either i mean i think these are some of my bigger questions like how do you imagine it transforming what we can design or, or yeah. does it or what would a what would a young designer who who's thinking about the future what do you what what should they be thinking about or looking at or maybe less so what should they learn to be able to do some of these things but how do you imagine it changing say what what young designers might be doing in the next couple of years on a construction site yeah i mean i think there are a few things like my fascination with this stuff originated from the concept of you know having some kind of digital model whether it was a parametric facade model or or BIM, and to be able to not just automate documentation and direct job site activity, but to actually uh, to actually deliver uh, what I like to call like machine readable deliverables. Whether it's actually it's file to factory, right? Whether it's generating like G code that goes directly to a machine that produces the part in the model, or in this case, whether it's somehow used to um, influence the robot or to help mission plan. Um, for the robot to do some kind of task on site. Uh, but my advice, I think, to someone studying this stuff right now is, you know, there are a lot of ways to look at it, but one is to take a more holistic view of how construction works and just learn more about it. I mean, my, my career has been this kind of steady migration from the design world to the manufacturing and construction worlds just because I felt like what's the point of, of designing in a vacuum where you're also not looking at the product right architecture is a weird thing where you like you, <laughs> you like design and make something and then you're like well i don't who cares if it worked or not or who cares if i have a measurement of its success success and that i'm on to the next one with no lessons learned so the the idea of like kind of continually improving the building the building as a product um also i kind of my interest in computation also migrated from geometric complexity because that was just what was exciting and that's also where a lot of like that's where a lot of money comes into architecture right basically like you have some rich client who wants to aggrandize their wealth with geometric complexity and then you hire somebody like me to take a weird shape in rhino and turn it into rectangles so you can make it into a building and after a while i was like this seems silly what if we just made like at WeWork, it was like what if we just made more efficient layouts um and just, I mean, you're just dealing with rectangles, but it's actually still a really hard problem. But like, if you can make a more affordable space for someone or a space that's more pleasant to be in, you know, doesn't that matter a lot more than just making something that looks weird, uh, which seems, which seems obvious, but like in the, in the silo that is architectural education, it was kind of hard to see beyond that for a while. Go ahead, Sarah. Hey, Sarah. How are you? <laughs> Hello. Hi. I'm good. How are you? <laughs> well, yeah, actually, I wanted to, uh, well, I had a technical question for you. 
and then I would like uh, just to comment on Carl's um, suggestion. Um, so the first one is, uh, how do you imagine the, um, the future in construction? Is like, do you think that is more likely to happen? There's there that a population of small robots of spots that will contribute in the construction of of an architectural unit, or do you think that we I don't know. It's just that we that there's um, we can have six axis robots more like like bigger units that can collaborate in a way to create. I don't know, like in terms of your approach and how these things can yeah. develop. Yeah, I mean, I think that well, one is I think that you'll see a lot of different types of robots. So you'll have kind of general mobility platforms like Spot to, to move materials and collect data. And then you'll have a lot of task specific robots like the Dusty robot, for example, that's really good at performing layout but can't really be used for anything else. Just the same way you have lots of different types of people on a job site and they'll all need to kind of connect and communicate with one another. But the other side of this too is that I think offsite construction and prefabrication is just as important as as in situ robotics. And I think both of those things need to happen together. And so I think that we'll still see a lot of use for traditional industrial automation in the context of producing buildings as modular products and deliver those to site. And then we can kind of question like, well, if, if we do most of the trade work in the construction and the assembly offsite where it's more efficient, um, you know, what's left, right? So what's left is like, is data collection and job site monitoring, um, installation and finish work. So you kind of simplify what needs to happen on field where it's harder to do the work and then you take care of the majority of it with offsite stuff. But there are still some like incongruencies between the two. Like we have a customer who's doing modular prefab bathrooms and every time they load a bathroom pod into the construction site the robot like gets confused because all of a sudden there's this like 10 foot obstacle blocking the entire path so there's like still a lot of work to be done to marry those two things but i obviously like my head's very much in the robotic space um the mobile robotic space on site but i, I don't want anyone to lose sight that it's like equally important uh, that we be focusing our efforts in, in off-site construction and, and manufacturing processes for architecture and construction That's interesting. And like in, in terms of involvement of the architect, the architects. So like if I, like I'm in Italy right now, I collaborate to some firm with some firms here. And like based on their feelings, um, I mean I'm interested in robotics because I well that was the topic of my dissertation, for instance. And then I work in academia and then I'm that that's these are topics that I'm really interested in. Um, analyzing but at the same time I feel that the architects uh, see robotics as something that is far away in the future so do you think that like architects that are uh, carrying out their jobs now are kind of left uh, out from this kind of conversation um, I, I'm a few minds about it uh, one is that <laughs> on one side of it it's that architects aren't particularly relevant in this conversation. And I know that can be painful for an architect to hear. Listen, I'm a recovering architect. There's a reason that I left, right? I was frustrated. I was just like, what is, what is the role here? We're siloed. We, we don't really have the power to kind of impact these things. And there are a hundred reasons for that. That's a completely different lecture. Um, the other answer is that, um, within the context of architecture and design, I mean, automation and robotics is, is there, but it manifests itself differently. I mean, BIM, BIM has been slowly automating the profession of, of architecture over the years. Um, and, and that has had a huge impact on how we practice, but it's just less sexy. Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's an automation of that work. I think there's an opportunity for architects to maybe claim some additional domains here. I mean, this idea of a digital twin in construction and the idea of like true as-built documentation is a pretty untapped area. I think, I think if I were an entrepreneurial architect, I would jump all over that as, as an additional service 
I could offer. Um, I think that construction administration can fundamentally change and allow for more remote interaction. Um, and I'd like to think that having something like spot on site would just be a vehicle for an architect or a designer to get remote access to the job site more frequently. I think part of the problem in the disconnect is that, you know, you have a few people in the office who are doing CA work and the rest of the office is just kind of sitting in front of a computer all day. And there's a, a huge disconnect between the intelligence that you put into the design process and then the intelligence that actually manifests itself on site. One of the things I learned at WeWork that seems obvious in retrospect is I was like, oh, the architect doesn't, doesn't actually design the final building. It's just the intent. And the intelligence required for the final installation and construction comes from the tradespeople on site. I can't tell you how many times like the carpenter, you know, doing installation and layout would notice something like, actually, this doesn't have ADA clearance or the door swing won't work. And they don't tell the architect, they just fix it. Um, because it's, it's costly to get that information back to the architect, but it wouldn't be costly if everything were, if the job site was connected, if you had mobile robotics and you had telepresence and communication, you could actually start to capture those changes. And then the architect can look at the fuller lifespan or life cycle of a building, right? You can start to go into asset management and hit the real estate market. I think those are the opportunities for architects. But I think in architectural education, we kind of fetishize and fixate on like, um, you know, you have to be directing the robots, you have to be doing the stuff and you have to be building the stuff. You should understand that, like that those, those are good fundamental things to understand. How can I dictate construction processes and techniques through uh, a well-organized design model? How does the gesture of design actually impact the installation and construction of an environment, which then manifests itself as a user experience that I am responsible for? Those are important lessons, but at the same time, we don't want to miss the greater opportunity for architects with, with as-built and asset management and, and, the, and the full life cycle, which is a sustainable thing, right? It's, we don't just like build something and walk away, but we're actually invested in, in the building as a product that has this full 30, 40, 50 year life cycle. And, and you said <laughs> in terms of telepresence, you can log in to a spot in, in where Cambridge or in Waltham. Yeah. And, so, and you yep. can walk around the office there from, from Brooklyn. Yeah, so, uh, you know, there's this particular spot that I use occasionally that has an LTE payload. So like you would per pay for LTE service for your phone, we've done that for a few of our robots. Um, I'm at home. I pick up my Android tablet that has the spot software on it. I look at my list of known networks. Um, so I'm connected with my home Wi-Fi, and then I find the known network of the LTE network uh, that's been installed locally at our headquarters and then it shows me the robots that are on that network. I select that robot and then I get to work. Now, this is also in tandem with our prototype docs because normally a robot is just off and I can't connect to it. So what you want is you want all of your robots to always be on and powered and ready to go. So you stand up from the dock, you disconnect and then you do your thing and then when you're done, you return to the dock and sit back down and log off. And, and you can just walk around and people see you coming down the hallway or what is that? Yes, like? I am not. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was funny too, because they were like, you are absolutely not allowed to do this like at night when no one's here because you can't, <laughs> right? Like once you give somebody that power, you, you can do that. And that, that would be the point in application. So no, I always did it supervised by someone. It was, it was actually one of the very first things I was working on when I joined up and it was really to do some early stress testing for uh, some teleoperation stuff. And now we actually offer for our customer conversations, we've built like a web app that allows them to do that very same thing. So we've basically built an obstacle course. So you're an interested customer at a, for a construction company. You basically just join us on like a Google Hangouts and then follow this link that opens the second web application. And then you can see through, you can get the view of Spot through like Spot's cameras. You can get the view a spot from like one of our static cameras, the kind of God's eye view. Um, and then you can also see the kind of real-time simulation view, which shows you also not only like a digital model of spot moving, but also how spot perceives its environment. So you can see like the point cloud it's making with the stereo depth cameras uh, from the terrain of the obstacle course. It's super cool. I mean, I love the, the aspect that you talk about. And I know Eric Wood, who's I think on the, the discussion or 
joining the webinar is we're going to do a webinar coming up where he's talking about the kind of culture of the office. And, and you're right, there is a kind of separation of knowledge, right? The, the designers who work on a project and then the people that are dealing with construction administration and even being able to learn from being able to go on a site. So like what I imagine too is like an intern being able to be in an office, be able to walk around the construction site and see those different things, whether it's real time with spot or it's just to fly through the data from one day to the next and see how that changes. I think there's a lot that could potentially be learned with that. Yeah, because otherwise you're just like fixating on like, what are the BIM standards and what family do I need? And that, yeah, they, right, you, what layer you get is that this, on? <laughs> yeah, yeah, a work set is not a layer. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of a disconnect from how things are actually built and constructed and, and manufactured too, right? So th that's the other aspect of this is that maybe you're not just placing a kind of rough like volumetric representation of something that somebody else will design and manufacture and, and you know maybe you're also responsible to produce that product as well and what are the opportunities there there's there's also an amazing simultaneity to it because i when we set up the studio the first night i i shared with everyone like some of the albert khan work that was being done in russia at the time right and it would be a question on the job site take a photograph print the photograph, mail the photograph to the office, review it, mark it up, mail it back, right? Yeah. As a way during that, the way that that process is going on. So that ability to be, like check out a spot on site, walk over to see something, understand it three-dimensionally, and then be able to, to give feedback is a, is a kind of radical change from something that we're used yeah. to. Yeah, and to be able to like do that while also having a conversation with you know the sub who's responsible for that. I mean, that's, that was, I mean, really like the thing I'm most grateful for from the work at WeWork was like, again, getting that full, like vertically integrated experience where like you're creating automated design tools. And then the second half of the day, you're like in the factory or on the site talking to the people who do it. And you just learn that like, that's right. If I just work in this vacuum where I think I'm going to make one perfect algorithm that spits out a building, you know, I'm missing all of this uncaptured intelligence that just doesn't, it doesn't exist in the technology and it doesn't exist in the architectural discipline either. It's kind of, it's, it's outside of that and it's about learning how to work with that and complement that. All right. So Daisha, I promoted you to a panelist. So Daisha had a question, then I think Zuby and then Krista. So if we don't see Daisha, we'll see if she joins. There she is. Hi, sorry, I didn't realize my video was off. I was just wondering, is uh, the need for robots or do construction companies want robots more because there's a lack of laborers? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that, yeah, there is a, there's a skills gap for sure. Um, but it, it's, but it doesn't, it's not like there's a lack of, of kind of skilled workers and the robots replace those skilled workers. It's there's a lack of skilled workers and they're working on the wrong things. Like we want them to focus more on where those skills can be better leveraged. And we want robots to do all these kind of low level menial tasks so that they're free to do that. Um, so it's a slightly, it's the yes, absolutely. But it manifests itself slightly differently than I think is, is popularly perceived. That makes sense that the robots are putting people out of business it's it's a different and more complex scenario right no i mean there's there man we, yeah when you when you work in robotics you just realize how incredible people are i mean it's it's insane what we can do um and and this is and this is obviously part of the reason why too i mean like robots are useful for the data capture side i mean yes the arms coming out there's going to be some manipulation of the environment but man that's a that's a really difficult problem. Um, and, and I think there will be opportunities there to collaborate with, with people, but um, the idea of, of these robots replacing uh, skilled construction laborers is, is, is pretty, pretty laughable at this point in time. Great, thanks, Daisha. So zuby has got a question for us too. Hey, Brian, how are you doing? This, this is amazing. I met you at the AAC Tech, I think in New York. 2018. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's incredible that this is happening in my lifetime. 
um, <laughs> just super excited. I like how you talked about the fact that the building, essentially the idea of productizing the building is not mm -hmm. static, and there's a, there's a life cycle associated with the product. Yes. Um, so how, how did this translate when you were at WeWork? How was this, you know, you talked about using sport on the client side. How did that translate into the development of other WeWork spaces? Um, was there any type of integration between the data that you captured while things were being built to how new things were being developed? I would, yeah, I think that's a great question. I would say that was, that was the goal. I don't really think we quite got there. Um, I think we were trying to solve it from both ends and never quite met in the middle, to be honest. Um, so when I started working there, um, I read, I was told to read two books. One was Skunk Works, um, which is about R&D efforts and about designers sitting in the same room as, as engineers and craftspeople to kind of understand the product that they're working on. Um, and the other one was uh, Frank Duffy. It's this really small book, and it's, I think it's called Work in the City. Um, and it's really this idea that like, there are different parts of the building that change on different cycles. So the idea that like, you just build a whole building, and that whole building is there for like 30 years, and then you tear it down, it, it's not really how architecture works, especially in urban environments with like, high-rise towers and core and shell development. It's like you have like, an infrastructure that's at one kind of pace, and then you have the core and shell at another one, and then you have like interior fit outs, and then you have furniture configurations, and they all change at different cycles. So one thing was, at WeWork obviously, like, you know, we were all, it was all workplace, and the idea was that you were going into these core and shell buildings, doing demos, and, and reconfiguring them. So we needed a kind of quick and, and cheap way to do that. So that was part of the thinking was to understand how to create modular product configurations that could go into any of these spaces and accommodate that. So there was like a lot of work. I mean, there's work all across the board from like, you know, furniture selection and, and uh, supply chain and product sourcing. And, but like the side I was on was really about like modularization of the design process. And, you know, could you in theory take any existing, cause this is all existing building stock too. You don't get the benefit of building from the ground up. Can you take any existing building look at the kind of key uh, boundaries like like core and slab edge and column grid and then like populate a one meter grid and then instantiate all of your building products in a way that also hit the right desk count so you're getting good like rent revenue from the desk unit and also created like a pleasant work experience and also hit all these different skew mixes as from the neighborhood right because one neighborhood might um cater more to uh, a type of artist that needs a different type of space than another neighborhood that's all about financial startups, et cetera. So it's like really complicated, but, and it all kind of boils down to like, can I get this into a grid and, a, and, and some kind of mass customization or, or repetitive like product environment? It's, it's a really tricky problem because not every building is the same. Um, so that was like one side of it. And then, and then I think, you know, for me, the dream was that you would demo a space, you'd send a robot through to scan that space. You would immediately, you would just have onboard algorithms. It's like, I don't need like a grasshopper script. That would just be on the onboard like CPU of the robot. So it's like, I don't want the scan. Like no one cares about those point clouds. Yeah. We care about what we're able to do because of those point clouds. So what I want is layout, right? I want a test fit. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to send that to the designers. And because there's still a lot of human love that needs to happen to those things and a lot of human expertise that needs to massage it. So that was one of the ways I wanted to couple those things. Um, more, more theory right now than something that's really been proven out, but certainly possible. The final question um, is what would make you go back to an architecture firm? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't, I don't, I mean, he, the thing is, is like, I get to, now I get to work with like all kinds of architects and I get to work with general contractors and I get to work with people in real estate and I get to like see the full cycle. So it's not like, <laughs> I, I, I'm being a little like tongue in cheek. Like, it's not just like, oh, architecture is the worst. I don't want to ever want to deal with it again. Um, but I'd rather be in a position where I can make these kind of cross-disciplinary connections than, than return to that side. So what would make me return would be an innovative 
mode of practice like we were right um that would be interesting but it would have to be a completely different business model than traditional architectural practice thanks that was great thanks Zuby. yeah thank you <laughs>